Stand together and sing. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear. The Come, let us all. 
that you sent your son to this world and he died for our sins. But even more importantly, on the third day he arose. And because he did, we have hope of everlasting life too. That we firmly believe that. And that we live lives that are guided by the examples that he set before us. And our desire is to that lost and dying world that you come and be a part of Jesus Christ this very day. This morning, if someone is here that has not put Christ on in baptism, if they have not made Christ their king, if they're not seeking his will in their lives, that they would do so this very day. We ask that you continue to be with PJ as he leads us in song, Mike as he brings to us the bread of life, and to all of us that we shut down the world and open up our hearts to receive your word in the manner in which it needs to be received. Heavenly Father, moreover, we know that we have failed you. We have done things that we shouldn't have done. And we've left things undone that we should have. We haven't encouraged people that we should have encouraged. We haven't lifted up some that was right there at a grasp and said, we love you. Help us today, Heavenly Father, to not give up doing good. And we ask your forgiveness of those things that we've done wrong. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I care not today what the morrow may bring, if shadow or sunshine or rain. The Lord I know ruleth for everything, and all of my worry is vain. Living my faith in Jesus above, trusting, confiding in His great love. From all Living my faith in Jesus above, trusting, confiding in His great love. From all I'm safe in His sheltering arm, I'm living by faith and feel no
There was once a little boy who, like me when I was little, was a squirmer in church. He didn't know how to be still and be quiet. In church, his parents were always saying, sit down and be quiet, son. Sit down and be quiet. One day, he announced to his parents, I've decided what I want to be when I grow up. Oh, really? What do you want to be when I grow up? I want to be a preacher. Why do you want to be a preacher, son? He said, I think it'd be easier to stand up and yell than sit down and be quiet. I think most of us are like that little boy. It's easier to talk than it is to hush and to be quiet and to be silent. But today's lesson is about listening. And many times in Scripture, Jesus is recorded as saying, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And we need to listen. And sometimes to be able to hear, to be able to listen, we need to be quiet and we need to be still. And there's so much noise in the world around us, we have to be very intentional most days to carve out some quiet times so that we can really listen. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. That kind of sounds like something my daddy would say to me after I'd done something not so bright occasionally, or maybe not so occasionally. He'd say, son, won't you use that head for something besides a hard rat? Jesus was kindly saying something like that. You know those two things, one on each side of your head? Use them for what they're there for. Use those ears for something besides holding up your glasses or your hat. They're there to hear. And it's not that people didn't hear. There was sound registering on their eardrums. But the point is, though they were hearing, they were not listening. They were not getting it. They were not hearkening unto the message. When Jesus says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear, he means listen up. He means pay attention. In John 10, 27, Jesus said, my sheep hear, my sheep listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. To hear or to listen is more than just registering sound. It's obeying the word of the Lord. It is following when the Lord calls. But because of all the other voices and the noise and the media in the world around us, the voice of the Lord can be so easily drowned out that we don't hear it. And then we just react to the stimuli in our world. We're like a pinball in a pinball machine just bouncing here and there, just reacting to things in our life without really thinking because we're not listening to the voice of the Lord in the people in our lives, in the events, in the opportunities that the Lord sends to us all around us in our lives. To hear the word of the Lord in everything around us, we have to be very attentive to the word of the Lord. Listening is a skill. It's also an art. But like any skill, listening can be honed. It can be sharpened. It can be developed through intentionality and training and discipline. We have some incredibly talented young people here, and older people too, for that matter. But we've got some incredibly talented young athletes here. We've got a couple of guys that can take a long pole and go to running with it, and at just the right spot, they can use that pole to propel themselves over a bar suspended above the earth, 12, 13, and more feet in the air. We have some young ladies who can take a softball. I don't know why they call it a softball. There's nothing soft about it. It's a big old heavy hard ball. And they can twirl that thing and they can release it underhanded and hurt you with it because they can hurl it with great velocity. velocity. And they were born with athletic skills, but they weren't born with them as good as they are today. They're as good as they are today because of years of discipline and hard work and training and developing those skills. That's the way the skill of listening is. If we will develop that skill, if we will grow it, it will bless us in our lives and it will bless the people in our lives for our efforts to learn to listen 
better. We need to be listening to the people in our life. And that starts with the most important people in our life, our family. Spouses, are you listening to your husband or to your wife? And I mean really listening. Children, are you listening to your parents? Parents, are you listening to your children? Are your children just, just quarter people or third people or half people not quite fully human to you? Or is each one of those precious little children, as small and little as they are, are they a full human being to you with full value and worth and worthy of your time and attention invested in listening to them? I've heard it said, and I think there's a lot of truth to it. If you won't talk to him when he's six, he won't talk to you when he's 16. We need to listen to our children. We need to listen to the other people in our life, like our friends. In your friendships, in your relationship with people, are you the giver or the taker in your friendship? There ought to be a little of both in a real friendship, but are you giving in that relationship or are you doing all the taking in that friendship with your friend? Part of the giving means listening, not talking, but listening to your friend. Are you listening to your co-workers? Are you listening to your customers or your clients? Are you listening to your brothers and sisters in Christ? I'm talking about really listening to your church family. Human relationships are part of the joy and the happiness in life. If you have fulfilling human relationships, you'll be a happier, more fulfilled individual. And there's very little that you can do that will build human relationships more than the skill and the art of listening, to really listen to one another. Sometimes what people are doing, what, what they call listening is not listening. They're just being quiet until they can get a word in edgewise. They're not really listening to understand. They're just listening to formulate a response. The only reason they're quiet is to figure out how I'm going to respond to the argument that the other one is making. They're not really listening to understand. They're only being quiet to figure out how to respond. If you really want to learn to be a good listener, be attentive. Really give the other person your full attention. And if you want to be a good listener, if you really want to grow your skill of listening, Learn to relinquish the need to always be right. You don't always have to be right. And you don't always, even if you are right, you don't always have to convince the other person that you're right. If you are, if you have facts on your side and you know you're right, you should be secure enough in the facts that you can be happy and fulfilled even if the other person doesn't agree. And listen not to always force your opinion on the other person. Just relinquish the need to force them to believe like you believe. And just listen to understand. Listen because you value them as a human being. Not because you agree with them, but because they're important to you and you care about them. Listen because they are a fellow human being worthy of your love and your care and your attention. And if you'll do that over time, you will learn that that's actually the best way to persuade them over time to your point of view. It really is sort of like an oxymoron, but it's true nonetheless. The more you try to force them to think like you think, the more you're going to push them away from that, that feeling and that thinking and that belief. But the more you'll back off and, and just leave that door open and just prove to them over time that you value them and care about them regardless of how they believe, that's actually the way that over time you can persuade them to your belief by not trying to be forceful about it. Listen to other people. But of course you know who it is we need to be listening to the most. The one that is most worthy of our Lending an ear is the Lord God himself. And I'm talking about a couple of ways of listening to the Lord. And the primary way is by listening to Scripture. Listening to what he has said 
in his revealed written word, the Holy Bible. I love that song we just sang, written by Longstaff, Take Time to Be Holy. Remember just a few of those lines, abide in him always and feed on his word. Spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. By looking to Jesus like him thou shalt be, let him be thy guide. Trust in his word, take time to be holy, be calm in thy soul. There are literally hundreds of verses in the Bible admonishing us to hear, to listen. Take, for example, the Shema in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Jewish people would often name a text or scripture by the first word in the text. Whether it's a, a book of the Bible for the first word in that book or a certain passage like Deuteronomy 6, 1 to 9. The first word in the Hebrew text here is Shema. Everybody say Shema. That's why they call it the Shema. Here is the word. Here. Listen. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one God, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength. So that first word is Shema, here. You've heard of the name Simeon, one of the tribes of Israel. A Greek equivalent or similar in Greek is Simon or Simon. Simeon and Simon are based on that root word Shema. Here, or listen, if you name a son, Simeon or Simon, you're naming him Person of hearing, one who listens, a man who hears. That's a pretty good name to wear. Someone who is a listener. That's what Simeon or Simon means. But, but Shema, listen or hear, means more than just use the ears. It means to obey. It means to hearken unto. It means obey the Lord, hear the Lord. That is equivalent to obeying the commands of the Lord. Now God is everywhere. He is in everything around us. In all the people he has created in his divine image. That he brings into our lives. But do we notice the Lord in the events. And the people and the opportunities around us. Do we listen to what the Lord is trying to tell us. I'm talking about. Not just in the Word of God. Yes, that's the primary way that He speaks to us. But I'm talking about what God might be communicating to you or trying to communicate to you when you're driving down the road in your car. What might the Lord be trying to communicate to you when you're working at your office or you're standing in line at the checkout at the store? God may be trying to say something to you, but you're too distracted and too inattentive to hear it. Now, please don't misunderstand me. Stay with me, okay? Stay with me. I'm not saying that God is going to talk to you audibly like He did in ancient times. God used to speak to prophets and patriarchs, and the reason for that is because the Word had not been revealed yet. It was still emerging. Today, the completed written revelation of God has been finished. Here it is. We don't need modern day prophets or patriarchs to say, I got a word from the Lord. You need to hear what the Lord told me to tell you today. You just need to look it up in God's word. God has spoken through the pages of the Bible. So I'm not saying that God is speaking to people audibly today. Get a little bit tired of hearing some of these preachers and modern day prophets saying, the Lord told me such and such. The Lord gave me a word to give to you today. Occasionally, I've called some of them on the carpet for that and said, okay, the Lord spoke to you to speak to me today. Yes, he did. And, and I'll ask them, okay, well, is, is the Lord a tenor or a bass? Or maybe a baritone? They said, what do you mean? You said, you said the Lord spoke to you. I'd like to know what kind of voice he's got. Oh, he didn't really audibly talk to me. I said, well, you said he spoke to you a word to speak to me today. And they said, oh, well, it was just a feeling. No disrespect, but this is my soul I'm dealing with, y'all. And I got to have something more than just your feelings because feelings are unreliable. Now, if you could be like Peter and Paul and say, I got a word of the Lord from you today, and here's a healing to prove it. If you can make my amputated arm grow back, if you can cure my blindness or my deafness or my lameness, you've got my attention. You've given me proof you've got a word from the Lord today. 
Somebody said, I had a dream. I have a dream every night. But that doesn't mean it's a word from the Lord. You're going to have to prove to me something besides just your feeling. Well, we don't need that today. They needed it back then because the Bible hadn't been completed yet. But now that it's here, we just need to read God's Word. So I'm not talking about looking for a message from God audibly. When God spoke to Moses, it wasn't a feeling. It was an audible voice that came out of that burning bush. At the baptism of Jesus Christ, there was a voice from heaven. It was not a feeling. It was an audible voice from heaven that said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And everybody heard the voice. In John chapter 12, when Jesus prayed, Father, glorify thy name, a voice from heaven came back and said, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. And everybody heard that voice. Everybody there heard it. Some thought it was thunder. Some thought it was an angel was talking. But one thing they all agreed, it was an audible voice that came out of heaven. God is not going to do that for you today. We have the Bible for that. What I'm telling you is that God does speak providentially. God does work providentially in your life. But are we aware of it? God may be trying to give you a word of encouragement today in a baby's laugh, in a friend's advice, or in the song of a whippoorwill. But are you listening? God may be trying to give you a word of warning today. Many years ago, I was out on the front porch of our house and there was a column that I bumped into and I didn't know there was a wasp nest in there. In northeast Mississippi, we call them big, bad, red wasps, wasps. This was a wasp. And it hit me right here on the end of my nose and knocked me off the porch and nearly knocked me out. I mean, it hurt. And he was giving me a warning. Stay away from my nest. And I heard the warning. I heeded the warning. I wonder if God's trying to warn us of something. And we're not listening. You heard about the old guy that the flood was coming and the authorities came by in a jeep and the flood was already up to the porch nearly and he was sitting on the porch and the authorities came in a jeep and they said, come on, get in the jeep, let's go to safety. He said, no, I trust in the Lord. Lord will care for me. Waters continued to rise and he was up on the second story of the house looking out his window and the authorities came by in a boat. He said, come on, guy, get in the boat, go to safety. He said, no, the Lord will take care of me. Floods continue to rise. He's up on his rooftop and a helicopter hovers over and throws down a rope and says, grab the rope, we'll pull you to safety. Come on, let's go. He said, no, the Lord will take care of me. The flood came. He drowned. He went to the pearly gates and he said, God, I trusted you to take care of me. Why would you let me drown? And the Lord said, I sent you a jeep, a boat, and a helicopter. What more do you want? I wonder what the Lord's been trying to say to you. I'm not talking about in some miraculous, audible voice, but I'm talking about the Holy Spirit using your knowledge of God's Word to try to convict your heart. How might God be trying to communicate to you today, but we're not listening? We're not attending. We can't hear it because we're so distracted by all the noise in our lives. Let me show you something in 1 Kings chapter 19. Would you go there with me in the Old Testament? 1 Kings chapter 19. Here's Elijah, the great prophet of God, and evil Queen Jezebel is trying to kill him. So he's run off in the wilderness, and he's hiding in a cave. And he's hiding in that cave, and the Lord comes and speaks to him. Let's pick up reading at verse 9. 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 9. He came to a cave and he lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And the Lord said, Elijah, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? And Elijah said, notice Elijah's pity party here. I've been very jealous for you, the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. I'm the only one true blue, God. And later on, God says, <laughs> later in the chapter, no, there's 7,000 people who haven't bowed down to those false gods. You're not the only one. But first, in verse 11, God says, 
all right, Elijah, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke, it in, and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. The Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, and we really don't even know how to translate this. It's something like a sheer sound of silence or a sound of sheer silence or a thin silence. Or a low whisper. Or a still, small voice. What's the point of this display from God? Big wind, big earthquake, big fire. God's not in any of that. God's in the still, small voice. Is the message that God doesn't always work big miracles to deliver us from our problems? Is it that God's not, already, not always ready to rain down wrath and judgment on our enemies? Is the message that God works in small ways and you need to learn to see that? Is it that instead of looking for God in some dazzling special effects, we need to look for God and listen for God in the deep stream of silence? Sometimes to hear God, we have to create that silence. Now, silence can be a negative thing. It can be a bad thing. If your loved one needs an affirmation of your love and you're silent, that's a bad thing. Silence can be a good and a positive thing. I've seen husbands and wives married 50 or 60 years, and they'll sit together and not even speak a word. But they're in perfect alignment with each other. They're communicating with each other. I've seen a mother holding her infant, and that infant's too young to even know words yet. But that mother and that infant are communicating in their own language. David in Psalm 19 says, The heavens are declaring the glory of God. The firmament, the sky, is proclaiming His handiwork. And throughout Psalm 19, the first part of it, he talks about, how nature is pouring out speech. Nature is revealing knowledge. The voice and the words of the sun, moon, and stars are going out and sending out a message throughout the utter ends of the earth. God's creation is communicating something. But are we listening? God says, stop your striving. Be still and know that I am God. Recognize that I'm God. Psalm 46.10 Be silent before the Lord God. Zephaniah 1.7 The Lord is in His holy place, His majestic place. The whole earth is speechless in His presence. Habakkuk 2.20 Let your words be few. Don't be rash with your mouth or hasty in your heart. Ecclesiastes 5.2 Jesus prayed the Gethsemane prayer. The Bible says He prayed for three hours in Gethsemane. But we only have a few words of that prayer. Is that because most of the words are left out? Or is maybe part of that explained by part of those three hours is not just a constant monologue, but part of that three hours of prayer may be Jesus listening. Just being quiet. And, and, and listening to the sounds in the still, quiet night of the the olive garden where he was. And getting in tune with God, the creator. I know God speaks through his word. But it's possible we can read it and hear it and not get it. Because we're not really listening. But it's also possible that God's trying to communicate through the events, the opportunities and the people in our lives. And we're not listening to those either. Maybe what we need to do is do like many of the great Bible characters who went off into a deserted place 
on their own personal spiritual retreat so they could listen to God. People like Moses and Elijah and John the Baptist and Paul and Jesus all spent significant time withdrawn from life and people for spiritual time. Philippians 4 talks about a peace that passes understanding. But I wonder sometimes if we starve ourselves of that peace because we've drowned it out with all the noise. And maybe in the silence, if we can create silence, we can get our souls back. What's the world trying to tell you today? What's the message of the world? It's that you are what you own, you are what you drive or what you wear, you are the sum total of your wins and losses. But what's the message of God to you? What's God trying to speak to you today? God, among other things, is trying to tell you it doesn't matter me, to me what you wear or where you live or what you own or how many failures you've had. You're my child. I knew you before you were born, and I have eternal plans for you. Are we going to listen to the messages of the world, or are we going to listen to the voice of God? In Philippians 4, the Bible talks about a personal relationship with the Lord. Notice how personal the relationship with the Lord is. Realize that the Lord shows the godly special faith. The Lord responds when we cry out to Him. We should tremble with fear and not sin. We should meditate as we lie in our beds and repent of our ways. Personal, intimate relationship with God can be had. But what it means is, is that you cry out to Him and you reverence and respect Him and you repent of your sins and it means meditation. We meditate in our bed on God. That's quietness. That's quiet night time. That's thinking time. And listening time, it's meditation. Dalton Key said, if you're average, you'll speak between 125 and 150 words a minute. And yet you have the ability to listen at an astounding rate of 600 words a minute. Potentially, you are a much better listener than a talker. Here are some action items in response to this message. For one, go on a, go on a retreat. Bring the desert to, to your home. Create a silent time every day, a retreat time, where you can meditate and listen. Number two, try unplugging. Silence for a few minutes all those technological intruders. Turn off the cell phone, pull the, the uh, earbuds out of your ears, turn off the video game, close the laptop, turn off the TV, and listen. The insurance industry gives us statistics the insurance people tells us that 3,500 people in America die every year due to distracted driving. And distracted driving costs American society $40 billion a year. But as destructive as distracted driving is, imagine how destructive distracted living is. It destroys our souls. Try unplugging. Number three, make an appointment with God. We're so busy, we have to make appointments for everything else that's important. Let's schedule time with God. And show up to the appointment with nothing but a Bible and a willingness to pray and listen. And let God speak to us through His Word. And number four, engage in little solitudes. Look for opportunities for solitude. Savor your coffee. Take a walk. Exercise. Read something positive and uplifting. Find a wholesome hobby. When you're driving on a road trip, turn the radio off for half an hour and just listen to the tires on the pavement. Because something might come to mind that you need to think through. Keep your eyes open, but talk to God driving down the road. 
You can solve a lot of your problems just driving down the road if you'll turn the radio off. And just think. And listen. And enjoy the solitude. Go outside at night and look up at the stars. When people quit shooting all the fireworks. And look at God's fireworks. In the clear night sky. These are some great suggestions and I know you could add some others. But we need to listen to God. Life is short. Death is certain. Sin is the cause. Christ is the cure. And you can receive the cure for your sin problem. You'll just make your way down to a front pew. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in Christ. And upon your confession of faith, we can baptize you for remission of your sins. When the eunuch taught Philip in that chariot, or when, the, when Philip taught the eunuch in that chariot in Acts chapter 8, they came to a body of water riding along in the chariot, and, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? And there was none. They went down into the water together, and Philip baptized him, and then the eunuch went on his way rejoicing. There's no reason why you can't go on your way today rejoicing because you've heard the word of the Lord and you've responded by joining him in baptism. Take care of that today. If you're a wayward child of God, come and confess that. Acknowledge it. Repent of it. Let us pray with you and for you that the God of heaven will give you a new beginning. He loves you and he wants you back. How do you need to respond? Chris is putting up our invitation song. PJ's coming to lead it as we stand and sing. We invite you to come. Blow your sands, be as scarlet. They shall be as white as snow. Blow your sands, be as scarlet. They shall be a communion cup needs one at this time. Chris, could you bring me one by chance? <laughs> I forgot one. Anyone other than me that forgot one? Bye-bye. 
Father, we come before you this morning, during this weekend, that as a nation we set aside time to remember the founding of our country and our declaration of independence from an oppressive government. Father, we are thankful for the country in which we live, for the opportunities that it provides us, and that though imperfect, we are truly blessed to live in the, in the country that we do today. But Father, today, as we assemble together as your people, we celebrate an even greater independence, an even greater freedom. We celebrate, as your children, the freedom from sin and from death. Father, we are thankful that you have reconciled us to yourself that you have granted us forgiveness and the adoption of sons. And this morning, Father, we recognize that none of this is possible without the blood and the body that was given so freely on that cross by your Son, Jesus Christ. This morning, Father, as we partake of these emblems, we memorialize him. We set our hearts and our minds on that great sacrifice. And in so doing, we we show forth the Lord's death until he comes. Father, for this bread at this time, we ask that you will help us to partake of it in a manner that is pleasing unto you, with our hearts and our minds centered on that sacrifice. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
continue with me in prayer. God in heaven, we thank you also for the blood that was shed on that cross, for the precious price that was paid for us that we might have hope of eternity with you. Father, as we partake of this fruit of the vine, we pray that we will do so in a manner that is well-pleasing in your sight. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Once again, we appreciate so much the presence of each and every one here this morning. I will uh, remind you that the collection box is in the back as well as collection plates on either side aisle. Uh, if you are worshiping with us at home and you would like to contribute, uh, we do also have the online giving option as well available on our website. Uh, and so if you would like to contribute to the work of the church here, uh, we would appreciate you doing so. Our closing song this morning is going to be My God and I. Uh, we'll sing the first verse only. And then we will be dismissed in prayers. If you would, let's stand for our closing song. My God and I go in the field together. We walk and talk as good friends should and do. We clasp our hands. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this opportunity to come and serve you. And Heavenly Father, as we're about to depart and go our many different ways, we ask that you continue to help us in serving you outside these doors. Help us to encourage our fellow man. Help us to share your word with them. Help us to be an impact upon this world, a greater impact than we have been in days past. Help us to be seen loving one another. Help us, Heavenly Father, to be an attractant to the world because of our obedience to you. And let our obedience and our love for you be the most important thing in our lives that can so well be seen by the world. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.